Okay, so we're beginning a new section of experiments, and Emily really introduced the topic quite nicely for us last class. And I put this topic, up, uh, this question out there for you just to think about in your head. My, my opinion is we always need to be doing experiments, right? So we do it in our personal lives, and then most of you try out new things in kitchens, new ways of doing things, different ways of driving to work, walking to work, alternatives. We're always investigating them, right? The moment you give up on experimenting, you've kind of given up on life a little bit, you kind of go, really? I mean, it's honest, right? If you're not that interested in things anymore, you're not that curious, well, why the hell are you for up? Right? So, experimenting is really, really important. We need to be doing it. We need to be doing it effectively as well. A little bit harsh. <laughs> Okay, so we've just looked at the section here on these squares. It's an important section for theory. These squares is the way we can use them to visualize our experiment. So one way we can consider the least squares section of the course is it's really a way of building an empirical model of the process. Right? So an empirical model, that term, by that I mean is we're not building a theoretical model. We're not fitting, for example, the premise plus one equation. We're going to simply build a model y is equal to e0 plus e1x1 plus e2x2 and so forth to our data. Now that y might be vapor pressure and if one of the x might be temperature. So the Antoine equation would be a better fit. But we're going to choose to use a linear model, an empirical model, or sometimes called black box models, gray box models, that will approximate the reality. And these models work phenomenally well. Fitting data to a theoretical model is sometimes extremely difficult. <coughs> so what we're going to do is we're going to use a very simple model, a least squares model that we're going to use now. We're going to use that on our systems. Why are we doing this? Well, we're going to build these experiments for several reasons. We want to do these experiments so we learn more about our systems. That's often one of the major drivers, so we can really understand a bit more about our process, something that we haven't figured out before. But once we've got that model, and the data is used to fit the model, our main aim is to make improvements to optimize. So this is really powerful. This is why Emily's introduction was so nice on Friday said that this can really make you a superstar in the company, and it's absolutely true. The methods here are trivial, so these ways model, you're totally comfortable with that. But applying it in a sensible way to maximize profit is something that's going to make you stand out from the of your colleagues. And the fact is, it's really easy to do. So let's take a look at that in the next few classes. Just to contrast that, it happens like this is data that you do not Create. You do not manipulate the process with Hampton Smart State. So a few of you have been proposing projects to me, like you'd like to uh, look at ex experimental issues around Tim Horton's role of the room. Um, you can't actually manipulate the variables in that system. Right? It's not under your control. That's Hampton Smart State. This is data that you simply just go collect. If I go out to people on campus and I ask them questions, those are survey questions, those are data that I just get, but I can't actually manipulate them. <laughs> So those are not, those are, that's why actually in engineering we're so lucky. Social sciences have a really hard time actually figuring out things yeah. because of those ethical dilemmas of manipulating people. You can't go make people live in poverty and observe how many children they have. Ethically. So in engineering we can go manipulate our processes and observe them. So let's take advantage of that. So but a few of you have been proposing experiments that are along the lines of happenstance data. You can analyze that data using these squares, but because it's not in a DOE format, it makes it really tough to make some judgments. In terms of where we're going over the next three weeks or so, we'll start off down here with factorial designs. And in today's class, we'll learn what that factorial design looks like. We'll talk about the issues of blocking and replicates over the next few classes. Randomization is a topic that will come up as well. And then next week, we should get onto the topic of fractional factorials. Emily mentioned this as well. This is a way that we can reduce the amount of work we use, but still get the same amount of information, or as much information as we possibly can. We're going to do a course project either as a full factorial or as a fraction factorial. So some of you have responded to your emails and said, 
We've got far too many factors. You should look at a fractional factorial. You may actually need to read the heading notes just to get to that in time, because we're probably only going to get to that at best on Friday, at worst on Tuesday next week. So if you want to get ahead in the course project, you might want to start reading it. Here it's not very, not difficult at all. This whole topic, actually, at DOE, is really easy to understand on your own. At the end, I will actually cancel one of the weekly tests and replace it with the response surface optimization assignment. Um, this is actually a little competition where you'll be competing amongst members in the class to best optimize a process. So when I was mentioning over here, uh, one of the main aims with TOE is to get to a higher profit. You'll be competing with members in your class and, and finding the highest profitability of a process using DOEs and response service standards. And I'll show you how we do that uh, conceptually in, in a few minutes. Now, in terms of readings, my book that you've been using so far is based pre pretty much on Box Hunter and Hunter's textbook. However, if you do have the money to buy this book, I do recommend it. Um, if you, even if you go purchase the first edition of the book, it's also quite okay. The one interesting thing about this textbook is about 30 years between the first edition and the second edition, and not a whole lot changed even in the second edition. So it emphasizes how well received this book is amongst uh, people in the industry. It has, it's, it's lasted this long. It's got really, really good advice and guidance on how to run experiments from an engineering point of view. So it's not a statistician's point of view, although Fox has a statistics background, but many of them are engineers as well. So this topic of experiments, as I've said, you, you've probably done experiments in your own life very recently, even in the past month or two, you've probably considered at least the simplest case, which is an experiment with one variable. So this is most commonly done, for those of you that are working in the labs in any way, you almost always do an experiment by changing one variable at a time. So you, let's try and investigate temperature. You run your experiment at low temperature and at high temperature. You observe a difference and you say, aha, I kept everything else constant. That is temperature's effect on the system is then quantified. Okay? Or you might even do a binary variable like catalyst A versus B, raw material A versus raw material B. So you've got categorical variables and continuous variables like RPM, revolutions per minute data, continuous variable. And we've learned how to analyze these data already in the course. All you do is you collect a certain number of samples from setup A, a certain number of samples from setup B, and then you use a confidence interval. Okay, so you hold everything else constant, only change A to B, whether A to B is a continuous variable or A to B is a categorical variable, it doesn't matter. But you collected N A samples from setup A, and B samples from setup B, pull your variances here, use your full variance here in your denominator, expand that Z value out into a confidence interval, and you get a low value. So we're totally comfortable with this by now. That is already the first part of experiments that you've, you've covered in this course, and you're, you're capable of doing it. And the way that you judge whether the experiment had a significant effect or not is by looking at the span. So does this range span zero? Yes or no? That will tell you whether it's statistically significant. We've had a bit of discussion on that and contrasted it to engineering significance. So there's a difference between statistical significance and engineering significance, or what I sometimes call practical significance. So we've, we've seen a number of examples of those in the science. And another issue we look at is how the confidence intervals with books. So the narrower the confidence interval, the, we get a tighter idea of that difference. So that's one way of doing the experimental analysis. Once you've collected your data, you can certainly analyze the data this way. There's actually a really neat other way that you can get the identical results. So this is in the assignment for this week. So what you can do is as follows. Take your data that you've collected. So let's take a concrete example. Let's say I'm measuring the viscosity of plastic. So my y variable is viscosity. And I collect a certain number of viscosity measurements using A is polymer from, from vendor A. 
and B is the polymer from vendor B. And I'm interested in whether there's a significant difference between getting those polymers from vendor A and vendor B. So I collect NA observations with this particular polymer, and I collect NB observations with the second polymer. One thing I can do is I can build the least squares model as follows, where I create a y variable, which is as follows. So y variable is viscosity from sample 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. up to my up to a certain number. So let's, uh, let's go 1, 2, up to n8. And then I've got sample 1, 2, 3, up to nd. So I create a y vector, which is an na plus nd by 1 vector. So I simply stack up my viscosity values from the first polymer. Those are the first few rows. And then I stack up the remaining rows in the y vector from the second polymer. I can then create an integer variable, d, di is either 0 when I'm using polymer A or 1 when I'm using polymer B. So I create a, a factor variable in R. And I can tell R to build me a least squares model so that it can regress y onto the categorical variable. So when that terminology regress y onto the categorical variable, I want a linear model where y is described by d. So you create that in R. I, once you've got your y variable and your d variable, you say, build me a linear model with y as described by d. We'll build that linear model and then we can take a summary of that. Or you can take the conf in of that same model. And that confidence interval for g slope coefficient will match exactly the same as the upper and lower bound from the hypothesis or from the confidence interval that we saw earlier in the course. So this confidence interval is lower bound and this confidence interval is upper bound will match identically the confidence interval for that slope g. Really, really interesting that that works out so identical because the two equations are totally different to each other. Very, very different equations, but you always will get the same numeric upper and lower bound. So either approach is is maybe used to analyze data for that sort of experiment. So that's a question for you in the assignment where we will, you go back to the reactors TK104 and TK105, and you do a comparison there using the, the usual way that we saw earlier on in the course. So you will build this lower bound and upper bound, and then you'll repeat it by building a least squares model, constructing a y vector as follows, constructing a d vector with ones and zeros in it, and then you'll prove to yourself that you get the same answer. Please, just uh, one note, as I was writing the assignment, I went through an iteration and I forgot to update the question a little bit. So I have uploaded a new version of the assignment last night that tells you how to code that zero and one correct. So just if you downloaded it a day or two ago, just upload and download the new version and get the revised update to the assignment. Any questions on this approach? Okay, we're going to leave single variables behind and now go to multiple variables. And there's a good reason for that. And the reason is that single variable experimentation is okay if you only have a single variable. But if you've got more than one variable, you should not be doing this. And unfortunately, everything you've learned in school and even in university labs is poorly taught on that aspect. I'm almost to the point of saying it's wrong. So let's take a look at what you've learned. So you're going to take this, skip over this concept of randomization. I will come right back to it in a future class. But I would like to talk about this slide. And here I've illustrated what you've been doing in university labs and high school for years and years. And we'll learn why this is not the correct approach to follow. 
So Emily called this the cost on Friday. Um, it's a backronym which forces this change one single variable at a time to come out to cost. And it's very descriptive is because if you follow this approach, which guarantee your colleagues and engineering colleagues in the industry will, will, will intuitively say, let's do this, this is going to cost you money. You will not reach the optimum. Let's take a look what happens. So your company is currently running a bioreactor at a certain temperature and at a certain substrate concentration of feed. So you're feeding this material at a certain concentration, one and a half grams per liter, and at a certain temperature, 346 Kelvin. And at that, of those conditions, with your raw material, you achieve a yield of around 63%. On average, day in and day out, you may get a little bit above, a little bit below, but you'll generally operate in this region and you'll take yields of 63%. Now, in dashed lines below that is the true theoretical yield that you would get. And we don't know this in practice ever. So these curves are theoretical. We don't know what this shape looks like underneath. But here I've illustrated this for you so we know what the reality is. <coughs> So one day someone decides, you know what, we're losing money, our competitors are maybe making this product at higher yields than we're able, capable of making. Let's try to figure out how we can improve our process. So great, we do experiments. That's what experiments are for, it's for leading to improvement. But the first thing that comes to mind, well, we've got to only change one thing at a time. Right? That's what you've learned in high school, you've learned it even in the university labs here on campus, unfortunately. So you go ahead and change one variable at a time. And someone figures out, well, let's try to change temperature. I think temperature has the most effect on yield. Makes sense. We grow the bugs at warmer temperatures or colder temperatures, we should get different yields. So your first experiment, intuitively, is let's go to warmer temperatures. We should get greater yield. So you go up to 355 or 352 degrees. And you're like, oh, no, my yield's actually dropped. It's got 58%. So you've gone down. Okay, well maybe we don't actually understand the mechanism of these bacteria quite as well as we hoped. So let's go the other way. Let's actually decrease temperature. Right? We're changing one variable at a time. I'm only figuring out what the effective temperature is. So I go to level two. And after level two I get a yield of six seven percent and I'm so happy. Yes, this is great. We're decreasing yield. Let's keep going, right? If we decrease the temperature by a few degrees, we've got an increased yield. Well, why stop there? Let's go a little bit more. We go down to a slightly cooler temperature, 330 Kelvin, and we get even better yields, 67 odd percent. And then we say, well, let's keep going. And then we notice, okay, well, it's, it's kind of leveled off and even started to decrease. So at my fourth experiment, I realized I'm trying to get yields around 63% again. So I'm kind of back to, um, wait, 68. I'm getting yields of between uh, 66, 64, uh, 66, 5 percent here at level four. So I realize I've got some sort of optimum here at point three. So I come back and operate at point three. Well, then someone says, "Well, you know, there is an uh, there is an effect due to how strong we feed the concentration of this reactor. Why don't we try adjusting that?" And so you run a flip experiment at higher feed concentrations and you realize that yield drops off. Okay, so again, you've gone in the wrong direction. So we have actually learned something. The first thing we've learned is that you should operate at cooler temperatures, but not so cool as to, as to totally reduce our yield. The next thing we've learned that is interesting about our process is that we get lower yields at higher substrate concentrations. Again, that may be a little counterintuitive, but it might reflect our lack of, lack of understanding of the metabolic pathway of this particular species we're dealing with. So let's go to lower substrate concentrations. And I notice that as I go to six to seven to eight, my yield goes higher and higher. In fact, I could go run another experiment down here and yield will start to drop off again. And so I'll land up at this particular point that gives me a yield of around 69%. And I'm pretty confident now from an engineering perspective that I've got an option. I've improved my yields from 63 to 69%. That could be pretty substantial in terms of financial dollars. Or financial valuation. But we 
clearly see what's going on here, right? We've, we've still left some money on the table. We could have been operating at a yield here of 72%. And the only reason why we didn't get there is because we were changing one single variable at a time. We were not changing all our variables simultaneously. Okay? Now here's another thing, and this should bother you even more than a single variable at a time. What if the engineers had decided to first change substrate concentration and then change temperature? What would have happened? They have got pretty close to that optimum point. Wow, that's awful, right? We don't want to, to implement methods that give us different results, different ways, right? We want to implement a method that will always work reliably and not be dependent on the variables we pick. Now, you may say, well, look, you know what, eventually we would have been at this point and then we would have maybe explored temperature again and we would have explored substrate concentration. Like, we would have eventually reached this point over here. Absolutely true. You would have, but you would have done at least maybe 20, 30 odd experiments to get there. So, we want methods that will get us to the optimum in the fewest number of experiments and that extract the most amount of information. Okay, and that's the only way you can do that is by running factorial experiments. In fact, so when I mentioned there earlier on that you will be doing this later on as a competition, if you go try changing one variable at a time, you will not you will run out of budget. So I'm going to give you a budget of running 20 experiments, and you should be able to reach the, the optimum easily within those 20 experiments. If you choose to run one variable at a time, you will not reach the optimum. You have to experiment efficiently. And as, as we've mentioned in class before, we don't often get the opportunity to experiment on the process. So when we do get that opportunity, we want to make sure we use our budget in the most efficient way possible. So this one single variable at a time, unfortunately, you've been taught pretty poorly. Now, the reason why I, say, why I don't say you've been taught incorrectly is because changing one variable at a time is a great way to uncover what a process is doing when you know absolutely nothing about it. So when you're in the lab over there in JHC experimenting on a process, your objective isn't to optimize the process. Your objective is to learn about the process. Okay, so then changing one variable at a time is okay. But if you had changed more than one variable at a time, you would have still learned the same amount of information and more. So changing one variable at a time is okay. Changing multiple variables simultaneously will get you the same amount of distance and further still. Okay, so it's always in your favor to be changing multiple variables simultaneously. So here I just described what we've done. If I had optimized, I would have univariately, I would have landed at point 0.3 and then I would have landed up at point 0.7. And we call that the cost of profit, when you do one variable at a time. And the issue is we've known for 80, 90 years now that this is wrong. Right? But we still, for some boneheaded reason, keep emphasizing this in our teaching and universities, unfortunately. So let's, uh, let's take a look at how to do that better. Before I get there, I would also like to point out this issue regarding non-design experiments today. So, it's often tempting for companies and for your manager to say, well, you know what, we've got these great databases in our company that have collected data for many years. Surely there must be information in that database that tells us how to find the optimum of the process. Why don't you just go look at that instead of, instead of messing up the process and, and running experiments? The reason why managers don't want you to run experiments in the process, there's several reasons, but Two of the major ones are firstly, you're moving the process to a new operating point. No one likes to do that because it's unpredictable. They don't know what's going to happen. Are you going to maybe move the process to a region where it's unsafe from an operating point? So if you don't know that, you're reluctant to actually go try it out. So pilots of aircraft kind of do that. Like they don't go fly the aircraft up and up and up into the atmosphere just to see, oh well, let's see what happens. Right? It's just we have constraints on our process, so we don't go like we don't like to push onto those boundaries. 
the second issue is whenever you run an experiment on a process, you're invariably going to produce a product that you're not able to sell. So you have to throw all that product away. So it's extremely costly. So it's very tempting for your managers to say, well, let's go to our database. Surely there must be something in your database. Well, let's take a look at this. As a very simple example, there's a problem where the company is is trying to understand how to maximize the yields in that process. And when they go look at the database, it tells them, if I plot yield against pressure, the engineer that goes and plots yield against all sorts of variables. And one interesting variable that the engineer finds is that if I plot yield on my process against pressure, I see this negative correlation. So instantly, the engineer's assumption is, well, to improve yield, go to increase the pressure. And on my yield, go drop the pressure down. Here's why that's garbage. What's happened in the historical data is the following. This is the truth. So this is a correlation. It's not cause and effect. Let's take a look at what really is the cause and effect. The cause and effect is that there's an impurity in your raw material. So your raw material you bring into your process has some form of impurity in it. And when that impurity is high, it causes foaming. And the operators have found that foaming is obviously a poor way to run the reactor. And they found that by increasing the pressure in the reactor, the foaming goes away. So high impurity causes foaming. Operators react to that in a feedback loop, so it's a manual feedback because it's a manual intervention, they do the foaming and they go and increase the pressure. So if I could measure impurity, this is a value that's not in my database, but let's say I could go and I have this data available, and I plotted impurity versus pressure, I see a positive correlation. Now there's another issue with impurity. Higher levels of impurity will reduce the yield. Okay, because it causes a side reaction that's unwanted and consumes some of your raw material, reducing your yield. So high levels of impurity, if I plot an impurity here on my x-axis and yield on the y-axis, collapse this forward into a two-dimensional plane, I'm going to see a negative correlation between impurity and yield. That's the truth. The cause and effect information is over here on the left. The correlation information is here on the right. So the correlation we get at the end is that pressure is negatively correlated with yield. But it's not a cause and effect relationship. So if you as the engineer told the operator to go decrease the pressure on the process, the yield would not go up. For the same batch of raw materials, if you went and decided to go decrease the pressure, that yield would stay exactly where it was. It would not move. So the problem is that in your historical data, you've got the <coughs> correlations occurring, but they're not cause and effect. The only way to break, cause, uh, to break correlation is to run an experiment. That's why we have to do experiments. If you're relying on happenstance data or your historical data, all you're going to see is correlations. You may see cause and effect in your historical data, but you're not guaranteed it. The only way you can guarantee cause and effect by running an experiment. So let's introduce a bit of terminology to get us all on, um, all on the same footing. And many of you are comfortable with this. You've emailed me um, saying that I'm going to investigate these factors and these are going to be my responses. So let's talk about factors. So this is not in your slides, but uh, it's, it's, it's straightforward. We've looked at this before. A factor is a thing that's being changed. It's what you're manipulating. So if I'm growing plants, I can choose a low quantity of water or a high quantity of water. If I maximize the sales in stores, so Coutinho and Lobos, they do this all the time. They investigate optimal product placement in their stores. So do I display the product three feet off the ground or five foot off the ground? Maybe you want to do an experiment about a first date or date night. Do you watch an action movie or a chick flick? You're changing something. If you're growing plants, you choose fertilizer A versus fertilizer B. What is your response? The response is something that you measure from the system after you've gone and made those changes. So it's the outcome variable. So if I'm growing plants, 
maybe I could choose as my response to be the height of the bond after 10 days, or the width of the leaves, or some other variable. There's several that it could be. But you know they'd be maximizing sales in the store. That's their response. So this is your quantitative output. You're able to measure it in some way. After running the experiment, you can measure the response. In most cases, the response is continuous. Number, so it's a yield, or it's a continuous variable. In a few cases, it could be a categorical response. It should be reproducible. And the general rule of thumb is if you're running an experiment, that you measure as many things as you possibly can. Because experiments are expensive to run, you will not have the opportunity of repeating the experiment later. So the first time you run the experiment, you should collect as much data as you possibly can. And for the date nights or the or the first date, you can pick whatever your response is. <laughs> Let's take a look at the factorial design. The factorial design has multiple variables at two levels. In this course, we'll only consider two levels. It's beyond the level of or the, beyond the amount of time we have available for us to consider variables that have three, four, or five levels. So a few of you have suggested experiments where you consider a, a grand A, B, C, and D. Well, those experiments certainly can be analyzed. We just do not go into the details for them in this course, but it, they are possible. So we'll consider in simple cases two levels, two or more variables. So remember I said we've got to change multiple variables, so the minimum number of variables we can have is two. We're not considering a single variable experiment. So we're considering two or more variables, or two or more factors, and each factor has two levels. The key is, for factorial experiments, we adjust all those factors simultaneously. Okay, and as I've indicated before, we either have continuous variables or discrete variables. So a continuous variable will have a low value and a high value, Short reaction time, long reaction time, discrete variables, we'll just pick two levels. So catalyst A versus B, or system A versus system A. And this is how it looks geometrically. So Emily drew a cube on the board during her talk, a three-dimensional cube variable, because she had three factors, three variables. Let's just take a look at a, at a simpler case. We'll get to the three-factor case in the next class or so. For the two-factor case, we have our sensor point. This is my baseline. And we don't have to run an experiment at the baseline. In fact, we usually do not run an experiment at the baseline when we don't have the resources. If we have the resources, we can rerun the experiment at the baseline. But at the minimum, we must run four experiments. At the low-low combination, the low-high combination, the high-high combination, and the high-low combination. So all four combinations of two variables at two levels. So the, it's always 2 to the power k. k is the number of factors. So in this case, I'm considering two factors. So I've got four experiments that I have to run at four combinations. So my first experiment is run at low temperature and at low concentration. My next experiment, low concentration, sorry, high concentration, low temperature, high concentration, high temperature, and then high temperature, low concentration. So all four combinations. If I have the resources, I could run an experiment at the midpoint of the two variables. And what we're going to do is we run those four experiments. Remember, I, I said we have to be able to individually manipulate the variables. So I said I can manipulate temperature, I can manipulate substrate concentration. After I run that experiment, I will collect the y value, my response variable at that point. I'll collect the response values at all the other points as well. So I've collected four data points, four y values, one for each combination. And for this system, I'll assume that I also measure them with some error. So when I look at the numerical data next, there's some error in those data already built in. 
And what we're going to do is we're going to build a model that tells us which direction to move in next. This is eventually where we're going to go. We're going to eventually go, and our model is going to tell us if we need to build, we need to go to optimize the process, we need to go in this direction. Okay? The model is going to tell me to go in that diagonal direction too, if I want to optimize here. And then I'm going to rebuild the factorial over here. So run another four combinations. And it's going to then point me into this direction. I can land up in that optimum in about nine experiments. Nine to ten experiments. And guarantee to be at the optimum. But that's the other advantage of this method, is that once you get to the optimum, there's ways to check that you are in fact at the optimum. And whereas with the single variable approach, there is no way to ever be sure if you are actually at the optimum. Okay, so that's where we're going to head over the next two, uh, two three weeks. Is we're going to learn how to run this experiment and analyze the data. And then in the, about two weeks from now, we're going to learn how to move this factorial to a new location and reanalyze it and then move it towards the optimum. That's where we're going to head. So let's take a look at how we analyze this data from that experiment. Let's assume that I've run those four experiments. So my low value of temperature is 338 Kelvin, the high value of temperature is 354. Low value of substrate concentration is 1.25, high value is 1.7. I will talk about how those ranges were selected in the future class. I'll leave that discussion for, for a, a, another day. Uh, and this is the way we analyze our data, we write up our data. Let's talk about this for a minute before we move on. <coughs> what's shown up here on the board is what's called standard order. So standard order is the way we run factorial experiments. Obviously there's been many uh, combinations I could run those four experiments in. Uh, many orders that I could run those experiments in. So this is what standard order says. It says Identify your factors. So, so identify factors. And in this case, I've got two of them, T and S. Okay. So then write out the table in standard order. <laughs> Well, let's take a look at that. Standard order takes the following approach. How did I construct this table that's up on the slides? Write out your factors one per column. So a column for T and a column for S. And we will use the symbol that mo is given by a minus and high is given by a plus. So the first experiment is always negatives for all your variables. So in this case, I only have two variables, so it's negative, negative. That's standard order. The first row in a standard order table will be a, a complete row of negatives, always. The next step is to alternate the sign of the first column at the fastest possible rate. So the fastest you can alternate that sign is minus plus minus plus minus plus minus plus. So we know how many experiments there are going to be. Okay, so, so number of experiments is equal to 2 to the k. So I know here that k is equal to 2. I've got two factors. I know then that the number of experiments I'm going to have is 4. So right away, I know that my standard order table is going to have 4 rows. If we get to next class, we'll see experiments with 3 factors. I know that my table is going to have 8 rows. And if I have four factors, my table is going to have 16 rows, and so forth. So the, what you do is, after you've written minuses in the first row, is to take your first column and just alternate the signs all the way down to the last row. So minus plus, minus plus. <coughs> the next step is to 
alternate the signs of the next variable at the next slowest rate. So the next variable at the next slowest rate. So the next slowest rate is two minuses followed by two pluses. Okay, so for a, for a four row table, it looks pretty trivial. For an eight row table, you, you may have to think about it a little bit initially. Okay, so we'll, we'll have plenty of practice with this over the next two, three weeks. And you'll have plenty of practice yourself as you plan your own experiments. So the rule is the first column alternates at the fastest rate, the next column alternates at the next, at the next fastest rate, so two minuses followed by two pluses. If I had a third variable, I'd have four minuses followed by four pluses. If I had a fourth column, I'd have eight minuses followed by eight pluses. So, so that's, the, that's what standard order is. Now, I do not run my experiments in that order. Never, never ever do you run your experiments in standard order. If you do run your experiments in standard order, you might as well not do the experiments. Because what you will end up happening, end up getting, is you will confound your experimental data with some ambient conditions. So I'll talk about randomization in the next class. So randomization is critical to get valid answers for your experiments. So what you simply go and do is, Take these numbers one, two, three, and four, write them on pieces of paper, and then go draw them out of a hat. And if I go do that, I might get three, two, four, one as the particular order that I run this set of experiments in. That's the order you run. You always run your experiments in random order. You never run them from standard order. So let's go and assume that I've run those experiments now. Those are the four experiments, and there's my y variable that I measure at each combination. Low, low, high, low, low, high, high, high. So we're going to hear a lot of that sort of terminology in the next few classes. So low level of temperature, low level of substrates, the first condition, high, low, low, high. And the last table in your row will also always be a row of pluses. Your first row, a row of minuses, your last row, a row of pluses. Okay, I do not need to run a full experiment at the baseline. However, if I have the budget and the time, absolutely, you should. We'll talk more about running experiments at the baseline in a later class. That there are important experiments if we can run them. But at the very minimum, we must run the four outer edges. So how do we analyze those data from the experiment? So let's take a look at this. It's a very intuitive analysis approach. So I draw my experimental results geometrically. This is why the DOE section is pretty, pretty intuitive for most people. It's a, it follows a, a very nice geometric structure for the analysis of the data. So especially for a 2D case, it's a very easy analysis. Firstly, where would you run your next experiment to optimize the data? Which conditions? <coughs> low, low, as someone's mentioned here. You would operate your next experiment somewhere down here at lower temperatures, lower substrate conditions. Very, very easy to see from just a simple analysis or visualization of the data that there's a gradient in the process in this direction, going from low at this corner and diagonally down here. Okay? So that's why this is a, also a great way to analyze the data. You quickly start to see trends in your process. So here's low value of substrate concentration, high value of substrate concentration, low value of temperature, high value of temperature on these two axes. The analysis of the data goes as follows. Let's take a look at analyzing the blue region first. The blue region is the effect of substrate. So the vertical direction. We call these, there's some new terminology, the main effect. So the substrate concentration was one of my factors. If I ask what is the main effect of substrate concentration, let's take a look at how we calculate that. It's a numerical value. What's the main effect for substrate concentration? 
always evaluate your effects from high to low. Okay, so we may intend to go from low to high, but the way we evaluate our data is always follow the same procedure to go from high to low. When I say high to low, it's high value of substrates to low value of substrates. So in this particular case, I get two estimates of the effect of substrate concentrations change. I can see how the yield changes at low temperature by changing substrate concentration. So here I've gone from high substrate concentration to low substrate concentration, keeping temperature fixed at the low value. And here I've gone from high substrate concentration to low substrate concentration, keeping temperature fixed at the high value. So this totally comes back to what all those good things you have learned in high school and in your lab. It is valid. Keep all your other variables constant. We're going to measure the effect of substrate concentration at low temperature, keeping low temperature constant. We're going to, but here's the advantage of the factorial design. If you did this experiment in high school, you would only get one estimate of that effect. We're going to get two estimates of it. And so immediately we're going to have lower error. Okay? So in high school, you would have run your experiments as follows. Or even in university lab, you would have run your experiments as follows. So you run three experiments. One measures the effect of substrate, going from high substrate to low substrate, and another experiment going from low temperature to high temperature. And you would have calculated what is the effect of substrate concentration from those two experiments, and you would have calculated what is the effect of temperature from those two experiments. But with only one more experiment, you can now get two estimates of substrate from two estimates of temperature. So for very little extra work, you get half the amount of error. This is why factorial designs are so efficient. They get the same amount of information that you get from your regular way of thinking and at much, much lower error with very little extra work. So we get two estimates of substrate. 53% in yield going up to 60. That's a minus 7 unit change. We always go from high to low. So a minus 7 unit change. And then we get 64 minus 69, a negative 5%. So those two numbers are roughly comparable. We get a 7 unit increase if I go from high substrate to low substrate. And then I get a 5% increase in the yield going from high substrate to low substrate. So on average, that's a 6% drop in yield per 0.5 gram per liter increase or decrease the substrate. <coughs> okay, so let's be careful here on the turn on. I get a 6% decrease in yield when I change substrate by half a gram per liter from its high value to its low value. So in other words, I decrease substrate by half a gram per liter, I'm going to get a 6% decrease in yield. That's it. Yeah. Okay. So let's try to say it again. So I get a 6% decrease in yield when I increase or decrease substrate concentration. Let's just take a look at the data. So I'm going from 69 to 64. That's an up. I'm going down there by 5%. Here I'm going down by 7%. So I get a 6% decrease for half a gram and an increase. Okay, but when you write out this table here, you go from high to low. Okay, so people get tripped up on this, and that's why I intentionally do it so slowly. Let's make sure we can get that right. The reason why we do it like this is because when you build the least squares model later on, the least squares model is going to get you those numbers right away. Just plain variables to use. Okay, good point. On categorical variables, for those of you investigating your experiments with categorical variables, you pick arbitrarily one to be minus and arbitrarily pick the other one to be plus. It doesn't matter which way around. 
Okay, so next class we will investigate this other effect, and then we're going to look at visualizing this data in yet another way to help you.